Hello and good day, everybody. Film score fans around the world, welcome to the Go See Talk podcast experience. Today is a very special double header. We've got maestro Marco Beltrami and Miles Hankins, both professionals of the highest degree. We are excited to be speaking to them about, gosh, number of projects, everything from The Quiet Places, one and two, to their working relationship, to Nine Perfect Strangers, and everything that the future holds for these two extremely talented and bright composers. Uh, Mr. Beltrami, Mr. Hankins, thank you so much for being on the podcast. How's, how's everything in your world? Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Um, yeah, I mean, everything was going great, and we were beginning to record and do stuff, and um, and, you know, we spend a lot of time in dark rooms by ourselves. So getting out with musicians is really the highlight of our, of our, our days. But um, it seems like things are getting a little bit tighter again now. Um, so I don't know. I hope it, I hope it, things shape up. Cause that's, that was the one thing I missed in this past year was, was the, the, the live interaction with musicians. Yeah, just just when we thought we were out of the woods with this COVID thing, um, it looks like things are kind of closing back up. But hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully things things move in the right direction. We can get back to what we love most, which is recording with live musicians and having fun in the recording studio. Excellent. You know, I, I interview a lot of composers and that's kind of the thing that I hear the most often in uh, the past 18, 24 months is that that you, you do have that lifeblood and that energy that flows from, you know, the work that you guys do together or siloed. And if you just can't be in the same room with the professionals making the music or having that dialogue or just being able to be in a studio or um, recording session, it just kind of sucks the wind out of the profession. But um you know, I, I don't want to say that because um, I don't have quite the experience you do. Um, they say that synth libraries and uh, and, and uh, different programs that can emulate the symphony. I mean, they're getting closer. What, what are you guys takes on that in lieu of actually being next to these world class first chairs? Well, first of all, yeah, it does suck the wind a little bit because, you know, not just not not even just the musicians, but even just like what we do is a collaborative business. We work with directors and, and uh, producers and music editors and just doing that kind of stuff, playing music for a director. You know, we're used to having them come to the studio, talk about the work and it becomes, feels like a collaborative thing where, you know, now you send it, you don't know what they're listening to on their laptop or their, uh, you know, in their car or whatever. And then you're not sure how they're responding because you can't see that real time reaction to it. And it's, you get a bunch of notes and you're trying to make heads or tails of it. It, it gets a little bit uh, confusing, but um, in regard to, yeah, all the, 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 you know, the synthesizers and electronic representations. I mean, it, it's true. I mean, we, we definitely use that in our work. Um, we mainly use it not so much to replace live instruments, but to do things that either are manipulations of live instruments or, or completely synthetic based things that, uh, so, um, and honestly, that's not really my forte. I mean, I, I know it a, a little bit, but, um, um, you know, I work here in the studio with Buck Sanders, who really helps me in terms of the electronic side of things. Um, so I, it's, you know, what can I say? Yeah, and I mean, in terms of sample libraries, things like that, you know, they've become ubiquitous uh, in the in the kind of process for all media composers. But the truth is that there's, you know, there's just no, there's no replacement for a live orchestra. Um, sonically and in terms of the kind of performance aspects of it. I mean, we, we use these tools to kind of generate quick and dirty mock-ups and things like that. And, and they have become sophisticated, but, you know, Marco and I both come from a kind of place of um, really valuing live instrumentation. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always like very important to us to, to make sure that we keep that a primary focus in the, in the final recordings. Um, even in, in the case of Nine Perfect Strangers, if we have a smaller, live ensemble, we still want to feature that and make it kind of stand out. Um, you know, there are certain synth elements that we really lean on and we push forward in the mix and we push forward in, in the score 
And those are kind of proprietary analog synth components, modular synth components that we design and build ourselves. But when it comes to things like a violin, you know, we don't want to have a, a synth violin on the final <laughs> final recording, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a balance, but we, we do try to favor the live uh, musicians as much as possible. And, and actually, uh, Marco, I think uh, I was kind of remiss for not thinking of it, but I'm glad you shed some light on it. The idea that you being in the room with the director and having that dialogue, I mean, a lot of your working relationship together uh, has has been a, a number of projects, but also you guys have history with directors like Jonathan Levine and Guillermo del Toro and James Mangold. So I, I could see that that's also a deficit to a professional or a creative process when you're not just getting that that immediate feedback or having having what would be the next part of a conversation where you in the same room. I mean, you can't feel the energy. There's, there's a, a body language, even if there's nothing said uh, when you're playing a cue for somebody um, in their reaction, which, which is so important. And, um, and not only that, I find that when I'm playing a cue and there's people in the room, I'm able to sort of put myself in their shoes a little bit and sort of, I sort of feel, I, I, I feel the music differently, honestly, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm playing it back for somebody and listening to it myself, then when I'm actually working on it, I don't know if you feel that two miles, but it's like, oh, absolutely. Like if it's a cue you you fell in love with, and then you watch them sort of slouch in their chair, you, you immediately hate the cue. You never want to hear it again. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, there's something, I don't know what the, 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 the reason for it is, but um, it, yeah, you, you, you learn so much in those meetings. And, you know, what we do is a collaborative business. It's not pure music. It's music for, for media, for film and television. And uh, as such, you, um, you need to have that interaction. Well, let me ask, a, let's throw a grapefruit question out to you guys. Uh, I, we always like to start off with what got you into music, what kind of keeps you going, and again, with your working relationship, how you met and what made that so impactful to keep going. I mean, I started writing music uh, when pretty much soon after I started to take piano lessons. Um, when I was a wee boy, I uh, can't remember how old, but uh, it was always a passion. My, my, my parents did not encourage me to, to do music. Uh, in fact, they discouraged me a little bit. And um, um, so I went to college to get a liberal arts degree. I actually went to Brown University and studied geology um, and uh, sort of failed miserably at it. And um, then after that, on my own, I... I um, went to Yale School of Music and um, pursued the path that I really wanted to pursue. Uh, not totally sure that, that film music was gonna be my path, um, but there aren't that many paths to a, for a composer. I mean, either it's pretty much, you're either in the commercial world or you're teaching in an academic environment. And I felt like so much of the people that I saw going through the academia were uh, teaching almost like in a vacuum without this real world experience. So they were almost like writing music for each other. And it sort of lacked a um, perspective of an audience input. Um, and so then I, began to look into, um, into film music. And I came out and did a program at USC and Jerry Goldsmith happened to be running the, uh, the, the, the program that year. And uh, that's when I really got hooked on it. Um, I mean, I, there was film scores that I was definitely a fan of before that, but it, that really just, you know, learning from him, learning, I, I would say, the most important thing that has stuck with me uh, coming from a academic world that was often hidden in complex ideas and complexity 
it was the opposite with Jerry and with Jerry it was being as simple and as economical as possible and saying what you have to say as concisely as possible and with uh, the easiest way possible for the musicians to play it. Um, and I love these concepts, they really resonated with me. And I began to come enamored with it and pursue it. Um, the first film score I did was in 1996, which was uh, the, the, the first Scream movie. Um, I met Miles, uh, when did I meet Miles? I met Miles, when did we meet Miles? Um, we actually never met. This is the first time. <laughs> really nice to meet you, Marco. We've only met over Zoom. Really great. Yeah. By the way. No, we met. We met in like uh, uh, five or six years ago, 20, 2015, I think. Um, we met on Fantastic Four, and and I had Fantastic met, Four. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. I'm. I met Buck. Uh, Buck Sanders like a couple months before that. I think we and I had hung out and just sort of, you know, palled around the studio for a couple hours. But um, yeah, I think that was the first official. Uh, you know, how, how do you do? Yeah, that's right. And, um, uh, you know, the other thing about this business is, so as I mentioned right at the top, you, you're in the studio by yourself for long hours and all that. Um, finding like-minded people that share an aesthetic with you and you can trade ideas off of is, is sort of rare. I mean, it's not, it's not like with everybody you come across and um you know as soon as i met miles and i heard what he was doing i was immediately intrigued and on fantastic four which um let's say it had a, had definitely had some growing pains that movie um it uh it really was a, almost like a test of of um many things a test of compositional skills but also a test of endurance and um staying cool under pressure and dealing with a lot of changes and and miles like you know without him we would have been we would have been fired uh from the second week so um that, that's when when um you know really got to see him do his thing, and um, and so since then we've been working together on on a lot of stuff, and uh, uh, you know it's it's just one of those fortunate situations. Well, Miles, did you have a similar experience where your family was not very fond of your uh, career choice, or did you have good support? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean they were they were supportive. Um, my parents are not musical, but they're artists. My father is a painter; uh, he paints kind of. Um, large format, uh, like Western themed, uh, you know, kind of historical paintings. My mother was a, was a kind of a, she studied to be a fashion designer and then she was also an artist, a painter and things like that. So there was a big kind of artistic spirit in the family, um, but no, no real musicians. Uh, I, like Marco studied piano from an early age. Uh, I, I studied with some, actually some composition teachers as well uh, at, in my kind of early days. Um, and through my kind of junior high school and high school years. And, you know, I was, I was one of those guys, I was like, I kind of acted in the plays and I was the jazz piano guy in the jazz band. And I was studying, um, you know, I was studying composition and, you know, I was, I was just kind of spread out. And when I graduated high school, I was kind of torn what to do. My drama coach wanted me to kind of pursue acting or maybe directing. I had always been a, a lover of film, uh, classic film my whole life. And I kind of focused on, on music and jazz piano with this idea that maybe I would eventually find my way back to film. I went to the University of Miami School of Music and after that ended up back in New York um, studying with a great, uh, wonderful mentor and teacher called Darren Hagen, who's uh, kind of an opera, he's kind of a luminary of the opera world. And you know he's had commissions with the New York Philharmonic and he's a Guggenheim fellow and an apprentice of Leonard Bernstein. And you know he's one of those real, real the real deal kind of guys and he was an incredible mentor to me and around that time I was I was uh, I was uh, living in New York and I submitted for a competition which is now defunct but it, it was the Turner Classic Movies Young Film Composers competition and I actually think uh, I think Elmer Bernstein was the was the previous mentor of that program but uh, he had just passed away and Hans Zimmer had kind of taken over the role 
And I was, you know, I was one of the five finalists for that. And they flew me out to LA. And it was a it was a surreal experience. My my first uh, encounter with Los Angeles was, you know, being picked up <laughs> at LAX in a stretch limo, you know, and whisked over to the Roosevelt Hotel and squared around town with, you know, so and so. And and it was it was surreal and it kind of dazzled me a little bit. And um, you know, folks sort of made it clear that there was there was a place for me at the table here if I ever wanted, <laughs> wanted to come back. Uh, so the next year I, I, I connected with some composers that I had met and got a, got a job working on a TV series. And that was 2007, I moved out here and uh, it was about 14 years ago. So I've you know, been, been keeping busy ever since. That's amazing. And, and you know, uh, you know, the, one of the topics we're going to be speaking uh, about is uh, Jonathan Levine, who you did long shot together with him, and he's the director on many of, if not all, the Nine Perfect Strangers um, episodes. But the thing that, when you talk about Elmer Bernstein, talk about a really world class musician, but he he did something interesting for the co comedic genre: Ghostbusters, Stripes, and Animal House, and the way he's able to play comedy straight makes it funnier than if you were to just you know try to ham it up because i remember having a discussion with christopher lennertz who actually studied under elmer and he would tell me about some of the the classes that he took and a lot of the um a lot of lessons he gleaned from that but um gosh so jerry goldsmith elmer bernstein um you know these are real world-class people how do you, you know, at a young age when you, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, 14 years ago, do you have, you know, are your eyes bigger than saucers? I mean, like, what, what's the intimidation factor just getting into this business and just seeing everything that could be working with people who have done so much already? I, I look, I didn't have the stretch limo treatment when I came out to LA. <laughs> For the <laughs> record, I haven't had it since. <laughs> it's in his contract. Whenever Miles works on the project, he uses stretch limo. Am I right? Um, but I was still sort of dazzled by the experience that we had um, working with Jerry. He was working on what was the, he was doing um, in that period. He was doing, I think, matinee and the Vanishing and um, um, two other films. So I, I escaped my memory now. Um, but it was such a great experience because he'd be working on the film and scenes and he'd give us scenes to, to do, the same scenes that he, would, he was doing. And then we'd come in and we'd sit at the piano, we'd show him our scores and we'd go through it. And it was always so humbling because <laughs> he would just, you know, get right to the crux of the, 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 the heart of the, the scene. And, you know, we we're always like searching. And, um, and then we would go to the scoring stage and um, he, we would record our cues with whatever group there was, and then he'd record his. And so he was incredibly generous with his, time and um, made it such an amazing experience um, that it was almost hard to go from, from being a student of his to after the school was done being like, oh, now, now what do we do, you know? And um, um, my, my first actual real world experiences working for Christopher Young um, doing, I was actually proofing scores for his orchestrator, Pete Anthony. And, um, and that taught me a lot too. Um, sort of another end of the spectrum. Mitch Hedberg is a comedian. He had this great bit. He says, sometimes when, uh, I, you know, when you do comedy, people ask you to do stuff that's related, but not exactly directly you know it'd be like if i if i was a chef and somebody says well you can cook but can you farm what are the things that you're asked to do that don't necessarily line up with you know what you thought you were going to do coming in the door well, i can tell you very specifically uh, and miles i'm sure has his own thing but um i hate horror movies and i never thought in a million years i'd be if someone said what kind of movie i i, I wouldn't pick but the fact is that 
a lot of 20th century music techniques lend themselves well to horror movies, the extended techniques and the timbral effects and all that. Um, and I, the first dozen movies I did were all horror movies. So, um, you know, totally unprepared for that. Uh, and went from a real innocent to uh, a jaded <laughs> horror movie composer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I would say like almost like the opposite happens sometimes. If 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 um, you know you're saying what what other things do they ask you to do? It, it, often it's the reverse. They'll sort of pigeonhole you and expect, oh, you've done twelve horror movies. That's all you can ever do, or something, you know. Or hey, you did a you did a, you did this kind of uh, animated series. Let's 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 book you for ten more of those or something like that. It's, um, but the interesting thing with um, Quiet Place and, and I guess some other projects we've worked on and just generally working with Marco is that there's always an interest in, in Marco always has an interest in trying to do something with an original voice. And that makes the exploratory phase of the scoring process really exciting because we're always trying to do something kind of fun and interesting, maybe even something that we're not asked to do. Um, you know, something that maybe the director hadn't thought of or the music editor who came up with the temp score hadn't thought of. and you know, trying to come come to it with a, with an original point of view, and you know, not always successfully. We're not always uh, we're not always allowed to to um, to, to kind of go there, but uh, we always try to. We always try to kind of bring something fresh to it. And a quiet place. I mean, Marco and Buck could could talk all day about it. You know, it's it's an incredible score that, and Marco was able to to write some really gorgeous. Um, just, just very, very intimate kind of family melodies and family themes in that woven throughout the crazy kind of cacophonous texture of the sound design and the production stuff like that. I think, I think we stretched pretty far on that one. I mean, in terms of the recording techniques, using carbon mics and and a lot of processing, and trying to create sounds that that weren't really, you know, sounds that weren't really familiar to people and hadn't been really heard before. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right, Miles. We did. Uh, it was that was fun. But we even on uh, on other movies like uh, when we did the Shallows, we were working with those big uh, plates. The um, yeah, the metal plates. Metal plates. Uh, and yeah, I mean that's. I think that's part of the the fun of this. What we do is that um, uh, the the neat thing about film music as opposed to concert music. Uh, is that the the performance is the final product, you know? So it's it, you don't have to worry about having to recreate this stuff live, um, at least while you're doing it. Um, and it's uh, and so you can really experiment with all kinds of crazy stuff and um, uh, and, and and have fun with it, you know. So I think that's what we try to try to do in all the all the projects that we do is just really how, how can we have fun with it? Well, Miles, let's go back to some of your jazz uh, leanings are and, and this is actually for both of you, but are do you when you approach a project, do you just get an inkling in your shoulder that says, you know, I got to do this because that's what my heart is telling me, you know, based on your upbringing or your personal leanings and um, a little further do you guys have a favorite instrument that you write for or you know something that you just think hey i, I gotta use a, a bazooki here or a you know a, or a water phone i just i just gotta try it because it's in well, me. miles can't do a score without a sharp nine chord you know it's got <laughs> yeah. we're gonna have to edit that out that that could be a, a career ruining uh <laughs> statement there <laughs> well, tell me, um, what, is, what is a sharp nine chord? Is that well, is it facetious or is that a real chord? Is a, is, is, a, is a kind of a classic jazz chord. This, you know, it's funny, there was a period in Hollywood when jazz scores were really in vogue, you know, the 50s and the, into the 60s. And, um, and there, it, it's, it's interesting to think that there was this period where like that was sort of the sound of Hollywood when you, when you listen to those classic film scores. Nowadays, it's, it's almost like uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's almost taboo to kind of reach into that harmonic vocabulary and play play with harmonies like that because for, for many people it triggers some kind of an old fashioned um, sensibility. But every once in a while, uh, since you asked, it, it does come up. We, we did a film uh, a couple of years ago called Long Shot. Uh, there was a scene where uh, Charlize Theron and, and Seth Rogen were 
dressed up in tuxes and gowns and they they went into this beautiful kind of uh, gala dinner setting and there was an orchestra playing and we we had the idea to take our little theme tune and, and kind of give it the Gershwin treatment so we we had some fun with that uh, writing you know reaching back into my kind of jazz arranging classes from college you know flexing those muscles for the first time in a while it comes up occasionally you know very rarely um, but even the uh, the chords that like uh, miles came up with these uh, these chords for tranquillum in um, in uh, in nine perfect strangers and even those are not they're not just strict you know triadic major minor chords there they have other notes involved they're extended and um, so I, I think it comes from that same place um, and and uh, it you know it, in this in the case of nine perfect strangers it gives it a little bit of that exotic feel that it needs uh, so I'm just curious uh, Marco what you think of this I mean since we're, since we're on the topic I mean to me it, harmony is always like the the, the real emotional trigger and the thing that really can kind of manipulate emotion it, it's maybe more than melody or rhythm or instrumentation or production or anything like that it's, it's well yeah you can manipulate the melody you manipulate the melody any way you want but with the harmony yeah and for me it's like you know the tranquillum chords are a great example where it's really just these four chords it's like uh they're sort of moving chromatically these kind of seventh chords minor to major seventh chords moving chromatically but if we had just played them as triads it would have been a completely different thing and it probably wouldn't have done what 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 we wanted it to do or you know if, like you say if you could just take the same melody and, and harmonize it 10 different ways and suddenly it's it's you know it's triggering a very different emotional response so for me like i always really and you know marco was talking about jerry goldsmith i mean i i love just diving into the crunch of jerry's harmonic vocabulary you know and the specificity of when he's throwing a natural six out there on a, on a minor chord or when he's not you know and when he's doing a minor seventh or you know just the, just the the deliberate choices that he made harmonically uh like give me kind of goosebumps thinking about it you know and to me i think that's the composer's like most powerful secret weapon is is an ability to kind of manipulate the harmony just slightly here and there and 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 see how it can completely change you know um yeah i i totally agree i mean i love sometimes for fun i'll take you know, classic pieces that I love. Like for instance, uh, there's Aaron Copland's Fanfare for the Common Man, which I'm, you know, but, and, you know, taking the, the melody, but re, restructuring the chords, you know, I actually turned that into like one of the most depressing pieces. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's a lot of, you know, it, you're right, harmony is, is, is everything. You know, where would Wagner be without the Tristan chord? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Could be nowhere. <laughs> well, one of the things that I, uh, I recently dug back into A Quiet Place 2 last night, and I, I, I don't know if this is because everybody's siloed and because maybe just you have so many projects going on, but um, there was additional music by Miles in A Quiet Place 2, including music from Brandon Roberts and Marcus Trump, but there were also eight orchestrators, including Marcus Trump. So uh, how do you guys divide and conquer on a project that had a lot more quiet moments than score? And what's kind of sort of the rationale for, you know, deciding on score versus sound engineering versus complete silence? Well, that is often a spotting decision that is sometimes we're part of in a quiet place. I think we were just told um where you know they wanted music and where they didn't uh it was a rather quick turnaround that process and um brandon and marcus are also two awesome composers uh and uh we all work together on projects um miles marcus brandon me and buck it's sort of you know, I'd say the, the five of us do a lot of work together. Um, and uh, there was a crunch on that. I mean, what, you know, it came down to not getting picture then getting picture and having to score like the next week. And, you know, we had all our, our ideas lined up and we knew what the material was and the sounds and all that. And it was almost plug and play, but we, um, it, uh, you know, it, so, 
there's no sense in, I, I don't see the sense anymore in, in having to do that alone because it's, um, it's just too much stress. So it's, uh, the, the business to me is much more fun when you can, when you can share it with, with other people. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a kind of important also to kind of understand, you know, sort of who's doing what there, you know, the orchestrators, um, you know, they have a specific role. It's a technical role. Um, the orchestrators we use are all brilliant musicians um, in their own right. And in some cases, great composers as well. But, you know, when, when Marco uses uh, his, his stable of orchestrators, which is basically Pete Anthony and, um, Pete is, you know, one of the kind of legendary orchestrators and conductors in, in Hollywood and Pete and Marco have known each other for years. Pete has his kind of team as well. So when you see, if you go on IMDb and you see a lot of names there, um, you know, those are going to be some of the folks that maybe are working under Pete's supervision. Um, but when you have a crunch like a Quiet Place 2 or, or any kind of situation where the time is really, you're kind of up against the wall, it's important to have a, a lot of hands on deck on the orchestration side because a lot of music is coming to them and it's fully written and produced music, but their job is to kind of make sure that that all makes sense on paper, get it to the copyist so that they can make sure that it gets put in front of the musicians in a way that's going to be readable. And like Marco said, when you're, when you're literally working around the clock, writing and producing and revising and conforming and writing and producing, there just isn't time to, you know, engrave your own scores and, you know, put your hairpins in and do your, do your, uh, you know, all your dynamic, uh, you know, engraving and everything. And, and it's, it's an invaluable asset to us to have this team of, of like world-class trusted guys that are going to come in and, you know, take care of like dotting those I's, crossing those T's. Um, but in terms of the writing, you know, that's Marco and, and Buck and, 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 and you and, and, you know, yeah. uh, so it depends. It really depends on the project, the stage of the project, what, um, you know, how, you know, what the, what the duties are. It, it's not, it's not the same for every single project. Yeah, that's true. Well, is everything these days just so chaotic? You just need to find whatever hands are available. I mean, I, I understand you go after trusted hands and people you've worked with before, but I mean, the idea that maybe a composer and a director can sit at a piano for eight hours and just say, yes, I love that key. I mean, is it just a big mess? I, I wouldn't say it's a big mess and not every project's like that, but I mean, certainly in this past year, yeah, you're not sitting at a piano with a director saying, how about this, <laughs> uh, you know, that's not happening. So, um, you know, that's one of the, the things we were rumbling about at the start of this conversation, but um, uh, it, some projects are chaotic and they're, you know, giving you totally new picture up until even when you're supposed to be scoring. And uh, some projects are, are more organized. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm working on a film. This one is just, is just me. And Miles works on projects that it's just him. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 really, it really changes based on whatever this the circumstances are well i tell you what, uh we're gonna spend the last um half of this interview going into nine perfect strangers uh fantastic drama the music is in the best way all over the place but we'll get to that in a second um <laughs> mr Beltrami, i i've been wondering something for years i've been watching snow piercer quite a few times i've listened into i've listened to the score a number of times what kind of easter eggs what kind of things when you see something over you know, you watch picture playback, you watch something. Do you, do you just glean onto one thing and say, well, there's an engine noise here or a whistle or something. I'm just going to try to slip that into the score. Are, are there things that you just try to get on the nose and just dive into a very granular fa um, aspect of the film? You mean like production sounds that I want to incorporate into the score? Is that what you're asking? Absolutely. Yeah, what I try to do, and this is fairly recent, I'd say this is, well, not that recent, but since I really became aware of this in the movie The Hurt Locker, which was a, um, you know, it's shot to be almost like this quasi documentary thing, even though it's not. Uh, but they, they wanted it to be very real. They didn't want you to be aware of music, but they wanted it to be very man manipulative. So uh, that's when I first became like, 
me and Buck uh, together, actually, uh, really uh, concerned with the sound. And so we worked with the sound designers that were, you know, this guy, Paul Otteson, who was working on the, uh, the sound of the movie and seeing what he was doing for scenes and how could we even take some of those sounds and make them into musical elements and, and, and make things so that you're enhancing the picture, but not necessarily, I guess, blurring the line between sound and music. And um, yeah, there's, there are scenes like that in Snowpiercer, like in the steam car when they're in the, uh, later on in the picture. Um, there's uh, um, all this, this whole like murder scene takes place there and the music, um, we wanted to incorporate sort of that hot steamy sound to the music and make it feel that way. Um, so it almost glistened and, uh, and that was done through a lot of processing and, and, um, um, you know, we, I think we even tried putting some things through some water effects and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, these are, these are things that, that, uh, are very picture specific. And, you know, you, you, you think about after you see the picture and, and, and wonder, you know, how can we just enhance the experience of this? Okay. Well, the reason I asked that is because I had a discussion with uh, David Newman and he was saying that sometimes you listen to a score autonomous of a picture and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, when you do get into that very granular aspect of tying to things or, or mixing with sound design and sound engineering, it makes sense when it's all put together, but sometimes when you listen to it apart, you just go, it, it, it loses the effect. So I well, just yeah, it's not pure music. It's not pure music. And oftentimes, you know, people put out these extended soundtracks, which I think are abominable. Like who wants to sit and listen to 90 minutes of little cues that don't go anywhere and they're just like, <laughs> they have no meaning. So, you know, I, 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 I like, well, let's try to find when we put together soundtracks that, you know, the, the best representation of something that's actually <laughs> listenable. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to do, but um, he's right. I mean, it, the, the, we're, we're hired to, um, it's music for a medium, you know, it's not just pure music. Mm. Well, Miles, I was scanning your credits, um, trying to find the things that I was most interested in. And one of the things that I found was you were an orchestrator for a Cirque du Soleil production. Um, can you tell us some about that? One of my favorite Cirque du Soleil's is a, a production called Curious, which is kind of a steampunk, kind of almost a, um, like a Hebrew vibe to it with the music. But what, what, oh, cool. what was your experience on that? Well, when I first came out to LA, um, I worked for a composer called Michael Picton. And Michael is a brilliant and versatile composer. And he, he has done a lot of work with uh, Benoit Jutra, who's, who was the... Um, Kind of principal composer for Cirque du Soleil for many years and I think he wrote Oh and Mystere and some of those big shows that are still on the Vegas Strip and through Michael I kind of did some did some work with Benoit on those projects I think I think we did a few films as well um, and yeah it was it was interesting it was an interesting process I you know I haven't done much else in the sort of live production world Michael has done quite a bit in that world but um, it's it's a it's a very different process than film scoring because you're not um, you're not dealing with with a picture you know you're not dealing with um, you know kind of like a linear timeline necessarily and a linear storyline it's it's kind of like here's an act and here you know here's a 15 or 10 minute act or something and the and the performers will do some crazy amazing things on stage and the the music has to kind of acknowledge certain sync points and, and, and do things. And then it kind of transitions to another act. So it's kind of like this modular assemblage of, of different um, mini kind of scenes. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting to work on that. I remember one of those projects, I think it was for a, a production that was, that was going up in, in Macau, China. So we had folks in, in Macau, China, which is like, I don't know, 15 hours ahead or something. And then we had, I think two of the orchestrators were in Australia. I think I think Benoit was hanging out in the Cayman Islands or something and then we were in LA so we were it was insane we were dealing with like you know five timelines uh, time time zones um, somehow got through that but 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a deep dive, man. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't thought about those gigs in a while, but yeah, it's, it's interesting when, when, when you kind of start out in the business, or at least in my experience, you know, you find yourself, uh, you know, with opportunities to do things that you probably would have never imagined, you know, and it's kind of a diverse, um, you know, kind of spread of different things that you do before you finally, you know, and you go through these kind of circuitous side side roads of like, maybe I'll try this and maybe I'll try this. And, you know, eventually, hopefully you kind of settle into, you know, what you're what you're best at and, and what you were hopefully meant, meant to be doing. Sometimes you find yourself just taking a project and going, man, in a situation where we're so glad we took it because it may not have been on paper what what aligned with us or something like that, but it ended up being fulfilling and led to relationships in, in the future. So what, what things have you maybe had a barrier to entry or a sales resistance or whatever it is, and you just go, wow, I had no idea this was going to be one of my best relationships or favorite films or just the melodies in this or the best things I've ever written. Certainly right. There, that is, uh, you're, until you dive in, you really don't know what the experience would be like. Um, Um, I mean, if you have something, Miles, feel free to share it. I, I it's not. Well, I, I think you know. For me, I you know, I can only speak to my experience. But you know, every everything that that's happened out here in in, in this business has been kind of like that. <laughs> you know, like I sort of have to constantly pinch myself and ask myself, like, what what am I doing out here? You know, this isn't real work. I'm, I'm I get up every morning and write music for a living, and um, and everything just seems ridiculous and absurd and crazy. I mean, I when I was er, talking about those early years, at one point I was. I was kind of working alongside Ron Jones, the great TV composer who had done Star Trek, and he was doing some animated series at Fox, uh, you know, like Family Guy and, and and things like that. And every week we'd go to those sessions. And, you know, I, I had no idea that when I emailed Ron Jones, you know, this guy who kind of scored the television soundtrack of my youth, that I would end up with this kind of postdoctorate degree in, 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 in sort of auditing film scoring sessions at Fox, Fox Studios, you know, and I, I would have never imagined that that would happen, but it did. And I, I made lots of connections and friends that way. And, um, you know, and then th through another connection, I ended up becoming a score reader with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And I was, found myself kind of score reading shows for John Williams and, uh, you know, film and TV luminaries and, and, and concert music luminaries. And it, it, it's amazing what can happen if you just say yes and step through a door. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Saying yes to experiences as opposed to shying away out of, out of it's like, even if you sometimes have that feeling of inadequacy or um, fear that to sort of squash that and, and to move on, I think is, um, uh, it's a great, quality to have you have a lot more out of life i think well what's your experience on uh, nine perfect strangers because um as a consumer uh, a hulu subscription holder i'm watching this and going I, I didn't read the book but i don't know which way this is going there's laugh out loud moments but then it gets very dark gets very murder mystery. It's jovial, sometimes turns into a cooking show. I'm like, how do you guys attack that from a musical sense with all the needle drop and the dialogue? Like, how do you even, how do you well, approach First of all, point? we were, I mean, that's the exactly the boat we were in is we because we didn't have all the episodes. We didn't know where the, the storyline was going. Uh, so we had to sort of, uh, we were like, just characters from, following along uh watching the story unfold which is really part of the fun of this project and i think one of the great things about jonathan levine not just on this but i see it as a trend throughout all his work that we've done um from you know long shot and uh the um the zombie movie um warm uh, bodies what's that warm bodies warm bodies yeah and um uh, is that he's always examining this complex organism the human you know and from all different angles and I, I that's what i love about it that it's it 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 radically shifts in this especially in nine perfect strangers from um the whole range of emotion and uh 
you know, for us that led to a lot, a lot of opportunities. I mean, yeah, there's source music and we, we knew about that, like where they were gonna have source usually, um, but it uh, led us to work on a lot of different melodic ideas, a, a lot of different things, you know, it was, it was sort of liberating. Yeah, it was like a challenge and a, and a joy, you know, to be able to have sort of a limitless, I mean, not limitless, we, we, we do have some thematic continuity, we use similar instrumentation, we, we tie things together, certain characters have specific themes, like Nicole Kidman's character, the, the spa itself, we have a kind of a thematic motif for, but, you know, we were trying new things, like, in the last episode, we were, we were going out in different directions, we didn't end up getting pigeonholed into one sort of sound you know there are some series right now where it feels like every cue is like just a loop of the same cue you know we we, we didn't have that problem we had the other problem <laughs> we we ended up with so many kind of diverse cues in fact when we were assembling the soundtrack cd we were kind of racking our brains like what kind of record do we want to make this we can make it the uh, kind of meditative spa spa music record or we can make it the kind of dark kind of action, you know, modular synth ostinato album, or we can, you know, have a string quartet record, you know, so we ended up kind of assembling an eclectic uh, sampler of everything. Um, but if you listen through it, the, you know, the albums on Spotify and, and, and everything else, you, you'll, you'll hear it. It's, it's kind of a bit of a schizophrenic uh, playlist, but I think, I think that's representative of, of the show and it's kind of exciting that way. Yeah. And you dabble in areas that, that, that seem trope laden you know like the uneasy strings and the creaking um that almost make it feel like a, a horror thriller but then again you get things like chamber music or the tranquillum theme or then you get like my favorite track is called may i go and it is it just it, it it's not one note which i think i really appreciate but i understand that's that must be difficult just because you're trying to track these this this narrative process i mean between michael shannon and bobby cannavale um, and Molson McCarthy, and then the um, Russian block unicorn, Nicole Kidman. It's like there's, you know, these different flavors that work with and pepper these unique characters. So, I mean, I just thought the whole time I'm watching, and I've only got this, uh, your press agent sent the six episodes, but I'm just going, I felt for you guys, like, how the hell do you even approach this? But <laughs> it all worked out. It all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. We love working with Jonathan. He's, uh, um he never wants to limit our creative process uh you know in oftentimes in um movies and tv they have temp scores which is what they use when they're playing it for you know it's not the final score it's music cut from other shows that they um use to to play it for the studios or actors or whatever and um oftentimes people get hooked on whatever it is and he he never does he's always like this is a guide but i want i want your input your um your take and you know also one of the other things about this is that on a series show you often figure out what this palette is in the first one or two shows and then you're just writing cues that based on that same thing this was it was really fun because we got to it wasn't any of that. I mean, there was a little bit of some thematic uh, continuity, but um, other than that, we really got to reinvent the wheel each show, and that was fun. Now, I also heard that you didn't get to see the last two episodes while you were writing the music. You had to kind of make it up as you go. Did I get that right? Yeah, we were we were in the dark. Uh, you know, we I think we were about halfway through the score, maybe even more like episode six or something, or five or six. And we still hadn't gotten episode seven and eight. And so we, you know, we were like approaching it like an audience member, basically. You were talking about the twists and turns and that, I think that informed the score in some way, in some sort of subconscious way that we, we had no idea where this was going. Mm -hmm. So we were just as surprised as, as hopefully everyone is, you know, as, as things uh, evolve. And so as, as a result, we were able to kind of react authentically to it um if, if you're kind of aware from the get-go how the whole thing's going to end you might subconsciously start to telegraph that or foreshadow that and, and 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 you know drop in hints along the way but if if you don't have that information it's it's impossible to do that mm -hmm. and i know for me like that's that's really great i was actually just speaking with with someone yesterday and they said you know do you like do you like to read the book 
beforehand? Do you like to read the script? Do you, do you want to go on set? And, uh, you know, and I, I know I don't, you know, I, I prefer to kind of see it as close to the way the audience would see it. Um, and it's close to final form if possible. Yeah, sometimes when you start on projects too early and you have, you already have a picture in your head about what it's supposed to be. And it's hard to lose that picture and, and uh, take on the, 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 the feel of the, the project that you're working on. And um, I've, I've worked on, like the worst thing I can do is start on a movie from a script because I invariably I'm going off in the wrong direction. I don't know if this is a good follow-up, but it's something that I've always been curious about. Um, Marco, I'm not sure if you were in the Hollywood Reporter roundtable with Danny Elfman um, when he said this, but he said the easiest part of the job is when it's a sequel, because that way you're kind of working off an existing palette. But I guess the question I have is that, I guess I, I, I have this parallel in the architecture world, where if you try to repeat what you did before, you kind of have diminishing returns. So what is easy about the job and is it when you have that palette that you have that you can now like pull it a little further or, or is that even possible uh no it is um i mean there's different examples uh, like the way we did in a quiet place for instance um you know in the first movie we the concept was to you know the, the people haven't had music and almost like they were forgetting what music sounded like. So we used a piano that had all the black notes were detuned a little bit. So it sounded a little, slightly out of tune, not in a circus way, but in a, um, uh, like a memory loss type of way. And um, when we went on to the second movie, we pushed that idea. And instead of just having detuning certain notes, we had a whole piano that was detuned by, um, by a half step and um, wrote the score using these two pianos. And we were able to achieve a lot of rhythmical and timbral things and textual things that we were thinking about in the first score, but we didn't have the opportunity to, to really explore. And so, yeah, I, I think it, it's sort of liberating because you already have themes, you already have uh, ideas, but um, you can, you can, there's always things that you're like, oh shoot, I wish we did this. So on a sequel, sometimes you can do that. Okay. Well, could you also maybe by that token say that as you're working on a TV show, maybe not Nine Perfect Strangers, but if you sort of start with something, it's easier in say episode 10 or 12 because you've laid the groundwork? Usually, yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I don't know. I mean, I guess it was maybe a little bit easier on this, but I, on Nine Perfect Strangers, but I think there was a, this was a little bit of an outlier show in that respect. And that, um, you know, for the reasons we were talking about, it's um, every show is really unique. So, um, yeah, there were some things that we leaned on. Some there was definitely uh, some properties that we that we discovered worked throughout the show, but. Um, yeah, we never got to the point where we could sort of phone it in by slotting in theme A, B, and C here. You know, <laughs> we yeah. had to keep the show definitely kept us on our toes, uh, you know, compositionally. Fair enough. Well, guys, um, I want to credit you. Uh, you guys have both participated more than 15 minutes. So this is That's like great. That first time, Miles, more yeah. than uh, we did an hour to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, before our time is up, if possible, can you tell us about some exciting projects on the horizon, things you're currently working on, or maybe just something personal you want to uh, broadcast or let our audience? Yeah, I with? mean, the, the next thing that Miles and me uh, worked on together was uh, is coming up soon. They keep pushing the release back, but uh, <laughs> Venom uh, movie, uh, Let There Be Carnage, it's called. And um, that, I think, is October now. So yeah, yeah I, we, we finished that this uh, during COVID and uh, that was a real fun project. We got to it, it stretch our legs in, in, in many new ways on this project. Um, and uh, I, I think it'll be a, 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 fun, a fun listen and watch. Excellent. Well, great. Yeah, I think the soundtrack for that will be coming out as well. And it's, it's, it's a great record. Um, we're, we're super excited about it. Marco wrote some great stuff and we all we all pitched in and had a great time just kind of writing our butts off and getting really into the spirit of it if you're a fan of, of venom if you're a fan of the genre like i think i think it's a great um 
you know, it's a great offering in the canon, the Excellent. MCU canon. Well, great. From a narrative standpoint, from a score sound point, sounds like um, we have a lot to look forward to the rest of this year and uh, everything that the future holds for you too. Thank you so much for being on the Go See Talk podcast. We'll catch up real soon. But everyone check out Nine Perfect Strangers on Hulu. Uh, Venom, there will be Carnage sequel hitting theaters, hopefully in October. And guys, all the best to you. Talk soon. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. All right.